be the best in the world at what you do or the only one doing it, because if you're the only one doing it, by definition, you're the best, right? And that's really should be a guiding principle. And don't forget that my other one, which is, you know, insight and perseverance, everything else can be hired. It's, it's really that simple. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. This is your host, Anushka at People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view, integrated, human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for FCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and video channel, which receives more than 400,000 visitors a year. And we also publish several interviews with well-known names globally every month. We have with us today, Jay Summit. International best-selling author Jay Summit is a dynamic entrepreneur and entrepreneur who is widely recognized as one of the world's leading experts on disruption and innovation. Described by Wide Magazine as having the coolest job in the industry, he raises hundreds of millions of dollars for startups, advises Fortune 500 firms, transforms entire industries, revamps government institutions, and for three decades continues to be at the forefront of global trends. He's an accomplished executive with experience launching new ventures and implementing strategies for global technology and media companies. We're elated to have with us today on Sam. Welcome, Jay. We're thrilled to be talking to you today. Hey, fun to be here. Likewise, the pleasure is absolutely ours. So, um, Jay, Diving my deep in the interview, the first question that I really have for you was, please do tell us a little uh, bit about your venture, jsummit.com, uh, and the experience that you've had over the years as executive chairman at Greenfield Robotics. So um, my website's just a way for uh, readers of my books to uh, get a hold of me. What I'm most uh, spending most of the time right now is my new book, Future Proofing You, and What's interesting is my first book, Disrupt You, is all over the world. I've heard from people in 140 countries. It teaches people to do their lives. And occasionally I hear from somebody that says, this is motivational, but I could never do it. So I took that as a challenge. Why am I not reaching some people? And I took a young immigrant to the United States who grew up on welfare. I mentored him one day a week for a year. I gave him no capital, no introductions, and didn't tell him what business to start. He had to start a business that took no capital. And he went from welfare to self-made millionaire in a year. And so I took all that knowledge and distilled it down to 12 truths. And if you follow those 12 truths and you work hard, you'll have the same results. So that's, that's really what I'm most excited about. And, and you know, I don't do this to make money. I do this to pay it forward, to make it easier for the next generation of entrepreneurs around the world. Oh, wow, that's lovely. Firstly, congratulations on the success of your new book, Jay. And that's some wonderful work you're doing there. I think uh, our audience are also really going to be intrigued to know um, the 12 core principles that um, you... Well, we don't have time for all of them, but let's go through some of the easy ones. The first one, I think we'll all agree, you have to start with a growth mindset. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So In the case of Vin, he grew up in a tough situation. I didn't have the time for him to organically get to that point. So I actually lied to him. There's a psychological principle called the Pygmalion effect, where a professor went to school, tested all the students, told the teachers these three kids would be the stars of the year. And at the end of the year, they took a test and those kids advanced the most. Turned out the professor lied, picked three names at random. If you tell people they're special, they believe it. And so I told Vin that I interviewed 100 candidates and he was the only one that had all the attributes to be a millionaire. When in fact, I only interviewed Vin. Because if I cherry pick somebody, it wouldn't be a fair test. So so a growth mindset allows you to see that the obstacles in your life are really opportunities in disguise. So the more problems you have, the more successful you'll be. One of the truths, truth number three, that I'm different than most people about is I hate those motivational gurus that go fear isn't real, fears in your head, fears make believe. Nothing could be further than the truth. We are hardwired to have fear. So when you're afraid of failing, when you're afraid of embarrassment, you're afraid of losing your money or your investor's money and all, real fears. But if you're walking down the street of Mumbai and a big truck's coming barreling at you and going to run you over, you don't think about those fears. You think of the more existential, 
jump out of the way of the truck or you die. Well, that's what you have to do with those other fears. Because the bigger fear should be this. If you're in a job that, that you're not growing from, that's not supporting you in the way that you want to live your life and, and, and take care of your family, you trade a day of your life, a week of your life, a month, years go by. One day you realize you have given up your entire life. That's just like that truck. And you don't want to give up this most precious thing for what? For fear? That's silly. And if you don't believe me, go to your grandparents, go to an old age home, ask old people what their biggest regret in life is. And that's not what they failed at. It's what they failed to try. So if you accept that principle of fear, now turn it around. Every person you meet in business, every person you're selling to, trying to raise money from, whatever, has the same fears. Now you can tap into their fears to get them to pay attention. At the beginning of my career, when I was very young, I had an opportunity to meet with the CEO of Pepsi. This was going to be the biggest meeting in my life. This was so important. I researched everything I could. I was prepared. To the CEO of Pepsi, I was the only thing stopping him from going to lunch. There was an imbalance. He could care less. And you don't get to the rational thought of somebody's stomach's grumbling. So I had to find a way. So you immediately tell him, thank you for taking this meeting. I'm glad you could do it today. Because tomorrow I fly to Atlanta, the headquarters of Coca-Cola. Now you get the fear in his mind. If I don't do this and my competition does and the board finds out I lose my job, now I'm paying attention. So that's just one example of, of how to leverage these basic fears. Um, one of the other ones, I'm trying to pick the ones that, that you know, would be most interesting short interview. Every business is a high-tech startup. Now, I've taught how to build a high-tech startup at the largest engineering school in the U.S. I'm not an engineer, by the way. You don't have to be an engineer. Steve Jobs created the first trillion-dollar company, and he's written as much code as you or anyone else, which is zero, okay? You only need two things to be successful, insight and perseverance. Everything else can be hired. So I don't care if you're opening a restaurant, a shoe store, whatever. We live our lives in the digital world. First thing you do in the morning is kiss your phone. You put it down when you go to sleep and you spend five and a half hours with it in between. If your business isn't centered there, you won't be successful. And then probably the last one, because our world has changed from the pandemic. It's accelerated things. It's changed things. It's crushed the middle class. And I do this to create more entrepreneurs because those are the only people that create jobs and make for a stable society in the middle class. But there's one positive that came out of this that a lot of people don't realize. If the largest corporations could snap their fingers and suddenly have 90% of their employees working from home, that genie's out of the bottle. But what that now means, if you're doing this startup, you don't need expensive rent. You don't need a headquarters. You can have a virtual company. For out history, you only got to hire the best people within 10 or 20 kilometers. Now you can hire the best people in the world. You also don't have to be in a high rent major city or first world country. You don't have to be in London, New York, or LA or Silicon Valley. You could be anywhere or you could be a digital nomad and be everywhere. I have a friend whose son works at Google. This month he was in Hawaii. Next month he'll be in Thailand. Maybe he'll run with the bulls in Spain. You don't have to wait till you're old and gray to see this beautiful planet. You can have a new work-life balance if you're not spending 80, 90, or two hours a day commuting. So. I list in Future Proofing You 22 free software tools to help you run that virtual enterprise. So this young man, his name was Vin, that I mentored, he went about creating a virtual company with no capital. You can read the book to get the details. But in the first month, he made $60,000. Now he had a growth mindset. Nothing was going to stop him. And later on in the, in the book, when he was about halfway through the year, his, his business got hit. I mean, nothing he could have predicted, nothing that was his fault. And I'm like, okay, it'd be a good book. A guy makes a half a million dollars. It's not a great title, but it's okay. But he had such a growth mindset that when that happened, he didn't go, oh, I failed. He went, okay, that didn't work. Time to regroup, but will work. And when we had our end of the month meeting, his target for that month was to make $100,000 to hit the million. And he came to me beating himself up that he only made $96,000. 
And I was laughing inside. If he could have imagined six months ago that he'd be beating himself up for only making $96,000. But that's the power of these truths. If you've read Disrupt You, there's nothing that I'm teaching or preaching that is rocket science that go, oh, I can't do that. It's all that our parents, our teachers, most of them gave up on their dreams and they wanna shelter you from that failing. They don't want you to have that pain. Pain is growth. Failing is part of the process. You're going to fail your way to success. Bill Gates' first company bankrupt. Walt Disney's first company bankrupt. Henry Ford's first company bankrupt. Jeff Bezos lost money year after year after year with Amazon and came out the other side as the richest man in the world. So I grew up normal working class. And if you would have told me a dozen of my friends would become self-made billionaires, that's with a B, I think you were crazy. But yet every 48 hours, there's a new self-made billionaire. What are they doing different? Can it be taught? Insight can be taught. In Future Proofing You, I teach you how to take your perseverance and transform it into passion. Passion will get you further. Passion is why, in this case, I, I took a young immigrant because one out of three Fortune 500 companies were created by an immigrant or their child. Why? Because even if they're doing what seems like a manual job, that's not their identity. They went on a road that started well before that and will carry them through. So if you can find what you want to solve, and entrepreneurs don't sell things, they solve problems. Solve for a few people, you have friends. Solve for a million, you become wealthy. Solve for a billion, you change the world. So that's, that's really what the book is about. And um, if you want to get on this path immediately, I have free workbooks. I'm not upselling. I don't sell seminars. You can't buy a t-shirt with my face on it. Why would you? Um, but I have free workbooks on my website. You asked about jsamit.com, J-A-Y-S-A-M-I-T.com. And you can, because when you read a book, sometimes you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then you get to the next chapter and what you read went out your ear. So here there's exercises you could do after each chapter to start building your life roadmap. And success isn't about money. The purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. Money's a tool towards that. But think of all the problems, all the injustices that you could solve. Because the only people that are gonna solve problems are entrepreneurs. Absolutely. That was such an exhaustive reply that you provided us, Vijay, and it was just so enlightening. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the, the way your book really stands out, I think uh, it's that it's really application based. And as you mentioned, you have exercises. And even like uh, in this answer that you provided, uh, the analogies, they were really, really valuable. So thank you so much for that. And I completely agree with you on how you need to have like a growth mindset and you need to um, not be afraid to try out something new. Uh, you need to let go of that fear. And uh, again, as you said, the pandemic has silver linings too. We can really be flexible in recruitment. And so I thoroughly agree with you on that one. Yep. And the other thing that you should realize is the only competitive advantage any business has in the 21st century is getting insights from your data faster than others. And insights and data doesn't have to be a computer business. You know, it's, it's looking at working on your business and not in your business. Give you a great example. Uh, three guys that I worked with uh, about 10 years ago. Back then, before swiping, uh, you actually dated on a computer. You know, you go on a website, see pictures, read about each other, and people hooked up. And with broadband coming, they had a genius idea. They were gonna create a new company where it had videos and you could see the person, hear the personality, see their smile. They were gonna make a fortune. It was called Tune In Hookup. They were great engineers. They built a perfect site. The first video, I kid you not, was a guy at the zoo standing in front of the elephant cage talking about why you should go out with them. Well, their business had a tragic flaw. No one wanted to date these losers but they looked at the data and the data showed them something that wasn't in their business plan. Nobody wanted to date these people, but they sure as heck wanted to show their friends how bad the dating pool was. So they shared the videos. So they changed the name of TuneIn Hookup to YouTube and became billionaires without a penny in revenue. Wow. I don't think a lot of us really knew the story behind that. So thank you so much. That was, uh... That was really something I think that's new for me and I'm sure for our audience as well. 
Most of your businesses that are successful didn't set out on that course. They pivoted. They looked at what wasn't working. And though I encourage people, I'll tell you something you don't expect to hear from me. Your idea for starting a company most likely sucks because it's obvious. It's something on the outside. It's not till you get into the weeds. It's not till you journey farther than others that you discover the real gold. And so you don't know how close you are to success if you give up. Sometimes you just have to pause and look over your shoulder and see how far you've come. And the, you know, the journey, whether it's a thousand miles or 10,000 miles, just starts one step at a time. And if you can get yourself to do that first step, then you take the second. And it's really that simple. I'm not saying that you don't have to work hard. Vin was willing to work harder than most people for a year so that he can live the rest of his life the way most people can't. I think that's a fair trade. I, I don't know if you know who Warren Buffett is. Uh, he just hit $100 billion, okay? He's worth more than me. Um, but he did it the make money, invest, make money, invest. He made 99% of that after he was 50. Being older than 50, I can now tell you, I would have had a lot more fun if I did it the Kylie Jenner way and became a billionaire at 22. And you say, well, she's a Kardashian. Yeah, there were no billionaires in the Kardashian family. What did she do differently? She followed these 12 truths. So it's all out there. The infrastructure's there, we're all connected. You're one click away from 7 billion customers. You only have to be right for a nanosecond to create wealth. So what is stopping you? Absolutely. So it's just about, we need to identify where we're being stopped and uh, kind of follow the 12 um, truths, right? Uh, on our Correct. To become one. Yeah. That was great. That was a really great answer that you provided us with Jay. Very, very enlightening indeed. <laughs> so um, if I could just go on to the next question. When we talk sure. about team building, what would you really advise our uh, leaders who aim to persevere team loyalty? Okay, so a couple things. One, don't hire people that are just like you. You already have one of you. Be honest with yourself. What are your weaknesses? What are your deficiencies? Who can be your team? My right hand for years is somebody that is so detail oriented, right? Don't give me an original contract. I don't care if it's a million dollar contract or a hundred million dollars. I won't know where I placed it, okay? So you need both types. The other thing, when I hire people, when I run companies like I was independent vice chairman of Deloitte, 200,000 employees, uh, Sony, 300,000 employees. I tell each person that reports to me, you do not work for me. I work for you. You tell me what you need to do your job. I'm not a mind reader. And if I get it for you and don't do your job, that's you. If you need something and you didn't tell me, we both suffer. The second thing I tell people is if you work for me for a year and you do not make a mistake, I will fire you. Because if you're not making a mistake, you're not learning. You're not trying new things. You're not figuring out something that wasn't done before. And your only chance at success is to do something else. So one of the 12 truths that this ties into is called fill a void, okay? You think I'm successful. I've probably failed more than anybody to get to where I am. But here was my secret. I discovered really early on, if you apply for a job, there's a thousand other people with more experience for that job. If you start a business that somebody else has done, there's somebody doing it better. On any given day, I can guarantee you, there's somebody smarter than me, better connected than me, richer than me, better looking than me, just plain old better. I hate that person. But if you do something unique, if you go to do something new that nobody else is doing, if you're the only one doing it, by definition, you're the best in the world at it. Then all you have to do is hold on to that piece of turf. So in Vin's case, he wanted to do social media. Well, there's probably 40 million people that know about social media. There's a whole generation that knows about it. And when you're a poor kid, you're going to get people that will pay you $100 or $200, right? Coca-Cola isn't going to hire you to do their social media. So I said, Vin, look in the news. What's something that's new? What, what's something that everybody's talking about? And position your new agency as the social media agency for that one thing. And that's what he did. And he got his first client. And even if your first client's for free, when you have that first client, you then have what they call an MBA school, a case study. 
and he killed it for that first client. And then he could show that to every other client. So the, the clients that were paying him $200 a month in month one, new clients were paying him 30,000 a month by month three. And today he's Fortune 500 clients. It's literally because he was the only one positioning himself. And there's always something new. You don't have to invent the new thing. You just have to apply it to solve a problem. Absolutely. So it's not about being a better uh, at what you do. It's about being unique. And the more that you strive to be unique in your niche field, you turn out to be better, right? Correct. Absolutely. Great. That was really well elaborated by you, Jay. <laughs> so um, the third thing, uh, shifting gears a little that I really wanted to ask you was a little on the lines of innovation. Now, innovation is a huge part of what we do today, especially with the ongoing advancement of technology. So in that light, how do you really see technology assisting uh, those within leadership roles? And we, we just like to know your insights on this topic. Sure. So we are living in a world with endless innovation. Things are changing faster than Darwinian rates. Most people can't adapt. So whether leader, whether employee, whether your team, you have to commit to lifelong learning. But that also means that there's something new that no one has a head start on, nobody has a market share. And I have one whole chapter on what, what is a new trillion dollar market. Google spending a fortune on it. Facebook, LinkedIn, Microsoft, Apple, they're all my clients, okay? But they're building the big chunks. They're not making the individual. So go back with me in a way back machine for just a second to 10 years ago, before we lived with our smartphones. When that first iPhone came out, you know what one of the top 10 apps was? A fart app. Yeah, you heard me right. Another one was a game with cats, which is another way of saying, no one saw all these businesses that could be created the Robin Hoods and the Open Table and the countless other things that have made millions and billions of dollars for people. Now, let's go to today. You now have smart glasses coming out from everybody, okay? Spatial reality, augmented reality. Well, if Google doesn't own this as the search plane, they go out of business. If your phone is staying in your pocket and Apple doesn't sell you these, they go out of business. Same with Microsoft and the other big guys. So, they're focused on the big pieces, making sure the 5G's out there, making sure the edge computing. But what problem do you wanna solve? And it's not just about adding things to the environment, and it can be audio. So imagine being able to understand whatever language is being spoken to you. Imagine being able to read any menu regardless of the language and not accidentally you know, eat dog or something. Or it can subtract from the environment. The doctor tells you you have high blood pressure and you shouldn't have any salt in your food. So you go in the supermarket and you say, show me all the products without salt and everything else disappears. Or you don't remember where you parked your car and you just see a line or whatever it is, you can solve problems. Construction crews can no longer dig into the ground and hit a pipe accidentally or a cable. They can see through the ground. So each one of these, you don't have to make the glasses. You don't have to invent this, you know, one of those clients that I mentioned actually has working contact lenses of this, which when people ask me, how do they do it? I say, okay, can't tell anybody, but it's witchcraft. I mean, I don't know how they do it. I really don't care. I fly all over the world, but I don't know how a plane works, right? I couldn't repair my car. So you don't have to be afraid of these tools. You have to say, wait a second, I have a problem in my life. And so that's the key to innovation. Solve a problem, solve for others. And by solving for others, you'll also get the satisfaction of joy of making the world better. I end future-proofing you talking about sustainable capitalism. This idea of endless growth on a finite planet defies the laws of physics. So we either figure out how to figure out the true cost of what we do and get ahead of the competition in doing that if we want to win. And there's so many companies going, Google, has been carbon neutral for 10 years. Think of how many server farms they have, how much energy they figured out how to do it. So what problem do you wanna solve that makes society better? How much better will you feel? And it can be imbued in anything. If you wanna get good employees, employees wanna work for companies with those shared values. Customers wanna buy products from companies with shared values. Anybody can make a shoes, but there's a company, Tom Shoes, when you buy a pair, they give a pair to someone that's never had shoes. 
sure makes you feel a lot better about your decision. So I really try to guide people towards all these growth areas that don't have competition. So when you go and do, you don't have to say, did I do a good job or a bad job? You're doing the best job of anybody. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's all about just giving back, right? Yeah, paying it forward. We're all in this together. So here's the other one. When you were in school, they taught you math that went kind of like this. If Jay buys a banana for $1 and sells it to you for $2, Jay makes a dollar. And most people think that's how business works. While mathematically accurate, nothing could be further than the truth. In game theory, that's called zero sum game. The only way I get money is if I take money from you. And if you go through life with that attitude, that person wants to take my money, they're taking our jobs, that country's taking our jobs, everybody against me, I hate the world. But let me give you my math. Jay's starting a new company, I'm gonna sell you 10% for $10,000. Okay, now what do I have? I have 10,000 in cash and 90,000 in stock. I can hire over that, I can buy things with that, I can grow the business with that. I'm an alchemist, I can make money from thin air. That's where billionaires are created. They're creating new value. And companies are very happy to overpay for startups. That's the other thing, I've been a NASDAQ company CEO. And people always go, I can't believe this sold for a billion dollars. I can't believe, you know, they have no revenues, right? Well, let me explain. When you're a CEO, when you have the job, you're supposed to tell everybody, I'm thinking about my shareholders. I'm thinking about my employees. I'm thinking about my customers. Yes, okay? CEOs are paid a little bit of money, but a huge bonus. You move the stock to that, they literally back a money truck to your house and they dump it and fill you with cash. So what are you gonna be thinking about? You wanna be thinking about what the board basically dangled in front of you. I will give you millions and millions of dollars if you hit that number each quarter, 16 weeks. So the easiest way for people with no skills and imagination, CEOs, to do it is to stop spending. So you stop R&D, you stop developing next year's products because you might not be here next year, they might fire you. So now you have all these companies hitting their numbers with nothing to sell. So now they'd rather overpay for something that's ready to go to market than spend years of losses to develop it themselves. When advertising was going away on television, um, I went to this little startup that had 30,000 in revenue being closed. They run out of all their money. And I went in there, took over as CEO. And 18 months later, News Corp bought it for $200 million because we showed them a future. And I've done this again and again. And that's why I try to teach people that it's doable. I'm not smart. I'm a dyslexic kid that just didn't give up. You know? That was such a wonderful response. It was so well elucidated by you, Jay. And um, completely agree with you on how we need to have our purpose and values in place while trying to contribute and make a positive change, right? Exactly. So um, just going on to the next question, uh, you have also built many strategic partnerships over a long period of time. So moving into the virtual world, how would you really advise entrepreneurs to build strong relationships? Oh, so here's a couple of things. So let's go back to that example. If you can agree with me that glasses are suddenly going to be the thing. Now imagine you're Google and you want them to buy your glasses and your Apple, you want to have your glasses. How do these companies get you to do that? Well, let's go back to when the iPad came out. No one had ever swiped before. Apple was worried people wouldn't understand what that is, right? You touched, you never did that before. So they searched the world for a, a game that would show people so they could show it in their tea commercial. So this little company in Northern Europe had 30 games that flopped. They were almost out of money. They made a little swipe game called Angry Birds. And Apple put in $100 million worth of TV commercials. So what does that translate to for that little company? Forget that one of the best-selling games of all time. How about $5 billion worth of T-shirts, underwears, lunch boxes, stuffed animals, you name it, okay? So big companies will advertise your product for free if it helps their platform. I call this OPM, other people's money. Anytime I'm going out to market with my product, I try to identify who else is trying to reach that same audience. 
not competitively, but if I'm going after old people and they're going after old people, selling old people, you know, walkers, they're selling them, you know, shoes, whatever it might be. So when I launch a music store to go up against iTunes, up against Apple, Apple was spending a hundred million dollars in marketing for iTunes. I had zero dollars and zero cents. So I looked at who was in trouble. And that year for the first time in history, McDonald's sales were down because of a movie called Super Size Me. They were down 9%. So I basically went to the CEO of McDonald's and I said, I can make you cool again. Buy a Big Mac, get a free track, put a little code on everything. And they made a magnificent commercial. They put our, our URL on every bag, every tray, every window of every store. They drove 20 million paying customers for my website the first week. They spent $60 million advertising my business. And for that, they didn't want a penny. I've done that hundreds and hundreds of times. Strategic partnerships are so important. And here's the reason, it was back to what we said earlier. Those big companies have huge budgets. But the people that get to be the CMOs, get to be the CEOs, they got there by doing a lot of politics. It's a miserable existence. So they don't have time for a lot of ideas. So if you can walk in with the idea nicely with the bow on it, ready to go, it's a win, win, win. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that, that was that was a great example that you provided us with. I mean, I'm just blown right now <laughs> regarding the McDonald's and the additional track you provided. But um, I, yeah. I think that is really what um, fosters better interpersonal connections, right? Just uh, strategic partnerships in a way. Yeah, I've done it with car companies, airline companies. I, I've done it so many times, so many ways. It's, it's even when you have a budget, it's more fun to spend somebody else's money. Very true, very true. So um, Jay, just to kind of wrap this interview up, do you have any quote that best describes your feeling about the future of work, workplace and you? Well, I think the one that we touched on earlier, be the best in the world of what you do or the only one doing it, because if you're the only one doing it, by definition, you're the best, right? And that's really should be a guiding principle. And don't forget that my other one, which is, you know, insight and perseverance, everything else can be hired. It's, it's really that simple. And, you know, everybody thinks of changing the world, but very people think of changing themselves. And that's what Disrupt You was about. If you can change that voice in your head that says you're not good enough, you're not this, you're not that, then you realize changing everything else is so easy. In, in Future Proofing You, I really went for the post-pandemic world. If you're broke, it's not your fault. Wages have been stagnant since 1982, before many people were born, okay? Um, you don't have to go to four-year university. Today's college graduates do not end up becoming wealthier than those that didn't go, that didn't go to college. Having a higher IQ doesn't make you wealthy. There's many, many bright people that are wealthy. So what is it, okay? Can it be learned? Yes. Is it out of reach of anybody? No, and here's how I know. We're human. We're adaptable. We're the most adaptable species that we know of. So whatever you were yesterday, whatever limitations you went to bed with, do not have to hold you back tomorrow. Don't think about past mistakes because you're giving up your future wasting on something that you can't change. And if you go with that attitude, and if you want to, my trick to keep a positive mindset, when I look in that mirror every morning, fortunately, I, I get older and older, but when I look and I say two things, today can be better than yesterday, and I have the power to make it so. And as simple as that is, that lights up the synaptic nerves, releases dopamine, gives you the same effect of being on drugs. So now you're in a good mood. You're likable to be around, you'll close more sales, you'll be more popular, and you'll get more ideas and more done. So I wish people success. I, I love to hear from my readers around the world. Um, if my voice hasn't annoyed the living day out, daylights out of you, you can get me an audible. I, I narrate my own books, um, or you can get them on Kindle, but everyone can achieve, and I want you to, to, to live your dreams. 
Very true. And thank you so much for that last bit of positivity and inspiring note that you ended the interview on. Uh, I think our audience are greatly going to benefit from it. And uh, personally, I would really love to read uh, your book and get to know the, uh, yes, the 12 key principles, right? The future proofing you, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you so much, Jay, for taking out the time to talk to us today. Um, my, my pleasure to stay in touch with you and uh, have a safe and healthy time ahead of you. Okay.